All right, we're going to go ahead and start our discussion of small business and entrepreneurship. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, if you've been continuing to review the, the lectures and continuing to play a part in those, hopefully you've been finding the information that we go over there to be useful. Um, likely isn't going to be anything that drastically different from your textbook. Uh, that is purposely driven by the fact that I do want to make sure that the two are somewhat consistent. Although if you have listened for a few weeks, now you're beginning to see maybe uh, maybe more of an in-depth discussion on some of the concepts that are discussed in the actual textbook. And that is by design, of course. Uh, I do want to obviously add some value, make sure to communicate things a little more succinctly, uh, but also in a much more detailed fashion to adequately prepare you when it comes time for uh, exams if you're taking this as part of a uh, credit course. Uh, so we're going to start off here by discussing small business and entrepreneurship. Very essential part uh, to not only the economy, but also as business as a whole. Uh, entrepreneurship really serves as one of the most important factors of production. If you've been a part of the lecture series for the last few weeks when we talked about economics, we discussed how countries manage the factors of production, uh, things like labor and capital uh, and entrepreneurship. And depending upon how supportive a government is to entrepreneurship, uh, that can in turn have a whole list of ramifications and effects that we're going to get into once we discuss a little bit more about entrepreneurship as well as small business. So uh, to start us off, let's talk about uh, what is a small business? Well, you're going to get different definitions depending upon what you read. Uh, the one we're going to work with is a small business is essentially a business that is independent, meaning that it operates on its own. It also has very little influence or relatively little influence on the actual market. Remember in past weeks we've actually talked about the different types of competition and kind of a side note that's why you do want to listen to these in succession uh, because the content tends to build upon one another it's by design uh, so if you do skip a particular week you're going to find me potentially referring to things that you're not quite familiar with that uh, so uh, do yourself a favor listen to them in order make sure you take good notes because a lot of the concepts and things are going to come up again that's by design uh, so back to our discussion of small business here. Um, we mentioned that a small business is a business that is independent. Okay? It operates on its own. It's not part of a larger corporation or a series of different corporations. has very little influence on the market, meaning that as a small business, if you decide you're going to raise prices significantly, chances are you're going to lose customers. Now, if you're in a market where you're in quite of a, a large business and there are no competitors, let's say you're a monopoly, well, then you do have an influence on the market if you raise prices because obviously people cannot go to competitors if you are the only provider of a particular good or service. So these are companies that are obviously smaller on a very small scale. Now, just so you have kind of a numerical idea of what a small business entails, according to the Small Business Administration, which is the SBA, a small business has less than 500 employees. Uh, that, so that is the technical definition that the SBA actually works with. You might sit there and think, well, 500 employees actually seems like quite a bit. And, and truthfully, 500 employees or a little bit less than uh, is actually quite a bit. But by definition, that still would constitute what we refer to as a small business. So why are small businesses important? Why do we really care about these smaller companies? Um, don't we just want to care about the bigger corporations, uh, the ones that really provide uh, all of the profits and different things? We've talked about how corporations, of course, um, but corporations can be small, of course, right? Because remember we talked about last week or in weeks past, corporations are really just a form of ownership, not an actual business idea. Uh, so why do we care, though, about small business? Why is it important? You know, it was recently announced, I believe in 2011, that uh, the uh, President Barack Obama had uh, let everyone know that the uh, uh, head of the uh, SBA, the Small Business Administration, was going to be a part of the actual president's cabinet. Um, and so that just kind of shows you how important small business is. Um, it's 
talked about repeatedly. You hear it a lot in the news. You know, how are we going to cultivate and encourage small business? You hear a lot of talk about regulation and how we should deregulate or at least lessen the regulations imposed on certain businesses to make them more able to operate and to encourage people to start businesses without fear of having to go through all of this red tape, all of this bureaucracy. So uh, back to uh, I am eventually going to get to why small businesses is important. Uh, so first thing, job creation. It may surprise you, but a majority of the actual jobs that are created aren't created by big business. They're created by actual small businesses, um, which is why you see the government trying to go to great lengths in an attempt to encourage small businesses to hire by making the environment advantageous, giving them tax breaks when hiring uh, certain types of workers. Because they know that small businesses are the drivers of job creation. It is not your big business. They do employ a large number of workers, but a majority of employees work for small businesses. And so we want to make it so that it's advantageous for those groups to hire because it is very, very important, particularly in an economy when we're suffering from uh, higher than normal unemployment rates. The next thing is that small businesses are responsible for a lot of innovation. Uh, A lot of things that we've seen that have come uh, to pass over the last several decades were really as a result of the innovation of small business owners and entrepreneurs who weren't operating in the scale of a large multinational corporation, but were working out of their garage like uh, like Steve Jobs uh, and Steve Wozniak. And so there are individuals like that who are really pioneers and are really developing the new technologies, the new products, the new services that are in turn being used by big business. Um, You see the picture here uh, of obviously uh, Thomas Edison, a famous inventor of uh, the light bulb, um, who later on went on to found uh, General Electric, which is obviously a large multinational corporation now, uh, but wasn't uh, back at this point in time. Uh, And you'll see a lot of large businesses will acquire small businesses that have certain types of technologies, that have the ability uh, to focus on certain uh, key industries. And it makes sense for big business to not take all the time and effort to develop themselves, but acquire smaller businesses that actually develop that particular technology. Uh, One thing I'll also mention before moving on here is you will see that small business uh, is very much responsible for um, more of the innovation side. Um, The large businesses, the the larger a company gets, uh, the more layers of management, right? The higher the organizational structure is, uh, the more difficult it is to be innovative. You know, companies go to great lengths to be innovative, uh, particularly large corporations, because the more people that you put in there, uh, the more things that are uh, kind of Uh, being worked on, uh, the more red tape, um, the more you're going to stifle innovation. And it gets really difficult to encourage people to think outside the box, think creatively uh, when they're kind of overwhelmed with the day-to-day work of their jobs. Uh, Google is a a great example of a company that tries to maintain an innovative environment. One of the things that they're uh, very well known for doing is one day a week they allow employees to work on any particular project of their choosing. It's not directed or drived by management or anyone else. It's simply something that interests them. And in doing so, by encouraging their employees to pursue their own interests and things that they find that could be useful, there have been a lot of innovative services that Google has introduced as a result of what employees have done. And Google employees have gone on to create their own small businesses and their own entrepreneurial ventures um, because they've been given the time to work on those things. Uh, and that is truly where what is important, is giving your employees the ability to commit time and resources and energy to some of these different ventures uh, for the purpose of uh, taking advantage of those and expanding into new things. 
All right, contributions to big business. Uh, this similarly coincides with what I mentioned previously about innovation. Uh, small business is a big contributor to large businesses because, as I mentioned, it's much easier for small business to be innovative. One of the main things is you don't have to go through multiple chains of management to pursue something. If you're a small business owner and it's you and a couple of other employees and you decide that, hey, we really want to get into this market, you can get into that market almost instantaneously. Uh, obviously depending upon what are the capital requirements and how much money you need and those types of things. Um, but big businesses, it takes a lot for a big business to really shift course. Uh, you can't stop on a dime and all of a sudden pursue a certain type of, uh, a certain type of industry or market. So you don't have that luxury necessarily. And that's what I mentioned when getting into larger corporations and businesses, acquiring some of these smaller companies that have had the, the time, but also the flexibility to commit resources to them. A uh, good example is that Apple has uh, acquired a number of different companies related to providing their own uh, map services. There's a lot of talk about going away from the Google Maps, which is the default map application you see if you have uh, an iPhone or an iPad or iPod Touch, I believe. Uh, and Apple is designing their, their own or has designed their own application that's going to be the default map application. And what they did is they acquired a lot of smaller uh, or companies that have been investing in the technology to provide that type of service. Not necessarily building it themselves, but finding the pieces and fitting them together. And obviously with Apple's uh, significant amount of resources, they're really able to put forth a lot of time and effort into those projects. So just another example of really how small business contributes to big business. All right, now we're going to talk about the entrepreneur. Um, you've undoubtedly heard this terminology before, you know, the entrepreneur, really, who is this person? What do they do? Hopefully, we're going to answer these types of questions for you here today. Uh, the entrepreneur is the person that accepts the risks and the opportunities, of course. And what they're doing is they're creating, operating, and growing a particular small business. Um, so entrepreneurs, people like Sergey Brin and Larry Page, uh, who famously found Google um, after creating an algorithm that ranks web search pages and provides reliable and accurate search results uh, to people that search on the internet. Uh, they are examples of entrepreneurs because they accept the risks of that particular business potentially failing. Now, in hindsight, obviously that was a really good idea. Uh, Google continues to be the dominant internet search provider, is expanding and has a very significant advertising business, and it has been expanding into markets such as handsets, so smartphones, and a lot of other uh, types of markets as well. So in hindsight, obviously a really good idea. At the time though, there were a lot of people that said what they were doing didn't really have value, which you may laugh at now as we use the term Google to search for anything, even if we're not on Google necessarily. But at that point in time, there was a different perception there. Um, so the takeaways here is that you want to think of the person that is accepting the risk, but also the opportunity. And we're going to talk about the incentive, or we have in past weeks, about why entrepreneurs do what they do. is because they have an incentive to do so, and that's the incentive of profits. And that's why in a free market system, in a mixed market economy, where people have the incentive of profits, then they're willing to accept that risk, or at least they potentially are willing to accept that particular risk. So why do people become entrepreneurs? You may be sitting there yourself and thinking, you know what, I, I really potentially want to become an entrepreneur. I'm not quite sure what that would entail, what I would do. Um, but let's go over some of the reasons why you might be thinking, I really want to become an entrepreneur. Or maybe if you don't, let's educate you on some of the reasons that people typically become entrepreneur and, or entrepreneurs. And maybe that might sound somewhat attractive to you. The first of which is greater financial success. Okay? Entrepreneurs, although they incur a lot of risk associated with starting their particular businesses, and we're going to go over how that's done, um, they can reap the benefits of that. And so there is always this attraction 
of providing greater financial rewards. Uh, now, one thing I'll go into, and I'll mention this previously, um, on a side note, I teach a couple of entrepreneurship classes. And although this is not a course specifically in entrepreneurship, I do try to weave in some of the concepts and things from my other courses, um, just as little nuggets of information, if it's something that you're interested in, hopefully it is. Um, but entrepreneurs, you don't need to be someone who actually quits your day job to be an entrepreneur. Um, I get a lot of people who think, I want to pursue this idea, so I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to pursue this. And, and for some people, that really works. Uh, for, for others of us who have you know, responsibilities and families and children and things like that, that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense or might not for you, uh, especially if you are the sole provider um, as I am. And so for myself personally, what's really worked is working late at night. Um, usually when my wife and uh, daughter are asleep, usually I can plug away at the computer for a couple hours and work on my own things uh, and have the freedom to do that. Now, obviously, uh, my primary responsibilities during the day are teaching, uh, you know, education related meetings, all those different types of things. But I still find the time late at night to go ahead and plug away for a couple hours and pursue my own entrepreneurial ventures because I like that type of stuff. That's invigorating for me. And the idea is, is that it can provide greater financial success simply outside of what it is that I'm doing you know, during the day. Uh, and so that might be attractive to you. That might not. You might think, wow, that sounds really overwhelming. That sounds very difficult and very taxing. And truthfully, sometimes it can. But the important thing is finding what you're passionate about. Start with things that interest you. Because that's when it's going to be not necessarily work, but it's going to be fun. And it's going to be play. And you're going to be in or, uh, you're going to be energized by the fact that you're doing that and not necessarily thinking, okay, I got to work for a couple hours and you know how draining that is. And I can think of a, about seven different things I'd rather be doing. Uh, and, and truthfully, we've all been there. You, know, you don't get to ultimately where you want to be without going through a couple positions and a couple things that you don't like. Uh, and I think that's how we build a, uh, uh, a, a kind of a, a guide for what we like and we don't like. Uh, but I think it's important to note that you don't necessarily need to quit your day job to pursue something in entrepreneurship. Uh, you can do that simultaneously, of course, provide another stream of income. If anything, hopefully a passive stream of income where you don't have to necessarily do anything but maintain it and it provides another uh, source of income. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail because we're going to get off topic, but uh, back to greater financial success, that certainly is one of the main things why people pursue entrepreneurship. All right, independence. And many of you, this may resonate for. Uh, independence from the standpoint of you don't have a boss. And how cool is that? You don't have someone telling you what to do, how to do it, and when. If you want to go ahead and, and you know, go out to the golf course and hit a bucket of balls for a few hours, maybe relieve some stress and come back home and, and, and type for a little bit or do some things working on your individual business, you can certainly do that. And there's no one that's going to tell you otherwise, except maybe a spouse or significant other. Um, but there's not going to be anyone there demanding that you can or cannot do that, at least in the form of a supervisor. And so that's very freeing. Uh, the idea of no one's going to tell me what to do. Uh, now, some of you might sit there and think that sounds just awful. Like I need someone to tell me what to do. Uh, if that's the case, you know, maybe entrepreneurship might not be the thing for you. It certainly isn't for everyone and that's completely okay. But others of you may be thinking, you know what? I really don't want to go to work and be told what to do. You know, I, I want to pursue my own things. I have passions, I have vision, and I really want to direct my energies to that. And that is certainly a primary reason why people enter into entrepreneurship. All right, next, flexibility. Okay, there's a lot of flexibility. There's not a lot of have-tos, probably a lot of shoulds, but not a lot of things that you have to do at this particular point in time. Uh, now, that flexibility, of course, you know, you need to realize that if you're an entrepreneur and you don't have a day job and you don't work, you probably don't eat either unless you're very financially blessed. But uh, there is some flexibility there. So you can decide what it is that you're pursuing. You decide how much effort to put in, how much time to put in. Um, obviously, with entrepreneurs, 
you know, they're, they're typically putting in more time at the beginning so they can reap the financial benefits later. Uh, but ultimately, that flexibility is, is, is key there because that's what allows you to maintain that, that family and work balance where you could, if you're interested in it, obviously go to, you know, kids' uh, soccer games, baseball games, award ceremonies and different things. You're not tied to, you know, a, a desk job or whatever it is that you may be doing. So flexibility, another very important factor. Uh, next, challenge. Okay, some of us love challenges. I grew up the oldest of four boys, uh, so obviously I'm very competitive by nature. You just kind of have to be. Uh, and so I love a good challenge, and it may seem daunting at first. Uh, there, there may be signs that I shouldn't maybe go that route specifically, uh, but certainly the challenge is the fun part. Uh, the end result, uh, the financial stability, uh, the additional income, those types of things, those are great. Uh, but the challenge, the pursuit in itself is sometimes uh, enough of a, a reason for people to enter into entrepreneurship. And so that would be another key reason and definitely a one for myself too, to, to look yourself in the mirror and to say that I created something, I did something, uh, is very, very powerful. All right, and next, uh, survival. Uh, notice if you've seen the movie The Gray with, uh, uh, with Liam Neeson, this is a clip from that or at least an image from that. I won't go ahead and spoil the movie for you. You can watch it on your own if you're interested. But uh, there are a lot of people that enter into entrepreneurship really out of necessity, uh, meaning that they have been laid off. They can't find jobs. You know, unemployment is well over 8%. And... You know, that results in a lot of people being out of work. That's the effect. And so a lot of people are turning to entrepreneurship um, because they're, they really don't have anything else to turn to. They've been, you know, uh, beating the pavement and, and looking for jobs and really can't find anything. And maybe you find yourself in that position. Okay. And maybe it's something where you may have a calling to pursue something in entrepreneurship. Maybe you have a passion that you're interested in pursuing. Survival is another reason why people start their own businesses. All right, so let's look at the characteristics of an entrepreneur. Maybe you've gone through those couple of different variables or factors I've listed and why people start uh, getting interested in entrepreneurship and you thought, you know what, I kind of like that. Not having a boss sounds pretty cool. The flexibility sounds good. I really want to make some more money. Maybe that's not your primary driver, but you know, sell, or there are very few of us that would probably say no to a little bit more money. So that could be something good. What are the characteristics of an entrepreneur? How do you uh, delineate between someone who is very good or is, is, is kind of the model of an entrepreneur versus someone who maybe shouldn't? Uh, usually in my entrepreneurship classes, I provide a very lengthy self-assessment, which is a uh, about 15, 16 page questionnaire, uh, not graded of course, because I really don't care how people answer, but it's just designed to ask you thought provoking questions where you can sit and really assess if that's something that you should do, you know, assessing your risk levels and things like that and having upfront conversations so that you know who you are and you have a good picture of that before you get into something uh, that you don't necessarily know the answer to. Uh, but let's look at some of the characteristics of an entrepreneur. We're not going to go through the questionnaire. Of course, that would take far too much time and you probably don't want to do that anyway. Uh, a couple things that entrepreneurs have, a vision, right? Or where they want to be ultimately and then develop a plan for how they're going to get there. I have this idea. I think I can take this to market. Uh, this is how I'm going to do that. Okay. They have energy. You need to have a lot of energy. You have to be a self-starter. No one's going to tell you to get up out of bed. No one's going to tell you to start working on your business. You have to have the drive and the self-determination to do it yourself. Next, it helps, although not requirement, but it helps if you have a little bit of a tolerance, the more the better, for uncertainty. Okay. If you don't, then obviously venturing out on your own where there are a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainties, uh, can be a, a very anxiety provoking, uh, particularly for any of uh, you that might struggle with anxiety a little bit, it will not help. Uh, so if you have a little bit of uncertainty or, or not a great deal of tolerance for uncertainty, uh, that may be an issue there if 
you know, you're relatively good. You can tolerate the uncertainty, not knowing what happens or what's going to happen tomorrow, how you're going to pay the, pay the bills tomorrow. If you can tolerate that, that's generally helpful. All right, next is self-reliance. Okay, Usually when you're starting off as an entrepreneur, the person accepting the risk, usually you're the only person working on your business. And so the, what that means is you need to be self-reliant. Uh, you have to be able to rely on yourself to get things done. Okay, That's not to say that you can't reach out to family and friends and to uh, other individuals who maybe have business experience and can provide you with some wisdom. Uh, but ultimately, in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, at least initially, you're going to be performing those day-to-day -day tasks primarily yourself. Okay, and So that's what means by being self-reliant. Uh, next is confident. Uh, confidence certainly helps, particularly when you're presenting yourself in front of others. Uh, you need to be confident in what you're doing, right? What you say has value. What you do has value. And so if you're confident in yourself, that's going to project in terms of what you're doing, right? Um, it's the people that are, you know, very uh, lack the confidence that say, well, I don't have anything to provide. What can I do that hasn't already been provided? I can't add value. If those are kind of the thoughts, the tapes that are playing in your mind when you think of starting your own business, uh, those, those aren't positive. And, you know, ultimately you're going to suffer from kind of that self-fulfilling prophecy where if you think it, it will come to pass. And then next, tolerance for failure. I don't know why in, in our society, it may have been in our uh, educational system, but we have certainly ingrained people that failure is bad. You should never fail. You shouldn't do bad on anything. You shouldn't fall. You know, truthfully, those are the times that I've probably learned the most. And so I've mentioned before, uh, but the pursuit is sometimes even more better than the end result. Uh, and what I mean by that is you might fail a couple times. You may try a couple things that don't really work out. Now, I encourage you to test those out on a small scale before you start committing a lot of financial resources to make sure it works. Uh, for example, if you want to start a restaurant, maybe start a catering business before and see if people even like your food. That would be a good thing. You would start something on a smaller scale and then start introducing it on a larger scale once you know you have a following. Uh, but failure isn't always bad. And we need to, look, we need to change our, our uh, kind of our perception of what failure looks like. It's not always bad. We learn a lot from it. And at the end of the day, you sit there, you reevaluate what you did, how it went, and what you could have done differently. And you implement those changes. Um, that's extremely valuable. And so if you uh, maybe fail at times or don't perform to the extent that you thought you could, um, you know, acknowledge that and, and, and embrace that, but make the changes so that you can improve later on. All right, so let's say that you want to start a small business, and hopefully if we got to this point in the lecture, hopefully you do, uh, and I encourage you to try this out. Um, unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail on you know the idea generation, the feasibility, uh, market analysis type stuff. Um, but you know that's stuff that you can research on your own, of course. Hey, there are courses that are uh, devoted to that, uh, so you can you can certainly uh, gather more information. You're not going to run out of uh, information uh, anytime soon. Uh, so let's say you want to start a small business. Okay, what are some of the things that you could do? Okay, first option is you can start a business from scratch. Okay. You can start it from the ground up, and that presents some problems, but also has some advantages. So, let's say you want to start a business from scratch. Well, one of the significant benefits is you don't have the existing business problems. Okay, you don't have to worry about uh, how the prior owner of the company, you know, made a bunch of uh, you know customers mad and all those other things, or you don't have to worry about a pending lawsuit for a company that you purchase. You know, everything starts with you, and so you start with a clean slate. Um, so all the existing business problems and issues and problems with your brand that people have. Um, aren't going to be existing at that point in time. They're not present, which is a definite advantage. Uh, one of the disadvantages of starting uh, a business from scratch is that you have a higher risk of failure. Uh, statistically speaking, 
you have a higher risk of failure. Now, there are things you can do to minimize that risk, things like a business plan, working through the financials, making sure you have a market for your particular product or service. So there are certainly things that we can teach you to help minimize that risk, um, but they do have a higher risk as a whole in comparison to the other ways of starting a business. So that's one thing to consider. Shouldn't be a deterrent from you from starting a business from scratch if you want to, but at least something to recognize so that you do your due diligence and make sure that you're you know, dotting your I's and crossing your T's. All right, next. Uh, and this you know, may be a matter of an opinion on my part. I'm sure people share my opinion here, but there's a greater sense of accomplishment, right? Um, to take something from nothing and to build it into something that's successful. Um, there is no greater sense of accomplishment there. Uh, and for, for those of us that have been there, uh, that can be extremely uh, rewarding of an experience. Um, but you'll find once you've done it before, you can typically replicate it. Right? You have your serial entrepreneurs, people that love to, to start new businesses and then pass them off to somebody to run and just love to start uh, different things. Uh, a friend of mine probably has you know, nine to, to ten businesses that he has started, has no interest in running the day-to-day, but just wants to start them, hand them off to someone else to run them, and then he can obviously collect some of that profit there at the end. All right, next. Instead of starting from scratch, you can buy an existing business. Certainly an option. Uh, obviously, there's a, a financial component to that. You typically have to pay money to acquire that business. Uh, but usually, they, there is a less risk of failure. And the reason there's less of a risk is because you can evaluate that business's performance, right? If that business has been operating for you know months, if not years, they're going to have financial records that you can access to look at to make sure it's a sustainable business, that they bring in revenues, that their you know, costs are at a certain level, that they've had a certain sustainable level of profits. What does their customer base uh, look like? What's their sales growth? Is it declining? Uh, those are the things that you can assess before. And so you have just a wealth of information to go from, uh, which is one of the advantages of buying an existing business. On the other side, you do incorporate those existing business problems. So if it has maybe uh, the business has an issue with its brand recognition, maybe uh, something happened to where uh, there is a potential lawsuit or people got injured from a product that, your, that this business started, obviously you would inherit those particular problems, which would not be ideal. But assuming you have access to everything, Okay? That's something that you should find when you're evaluating whether or not to purchase that particular business. Uh, one other thing I will mention before is you will typically have to commit financial resources to that particular business, okay? meaning that you're going to have to pay for them. right? If somebody's going to sell you their business, they're not going to give it away. You're going to have to acquire that business, which means you're going to have to have money, cash on hand, or some type of resources to ending up completing that exchange. And last, franchising. Okay, We've gone over franchising more than I probably care to, uh, so I'm not going to go into really what franchising is. Um, we've gone over that in past lectures. Uh, but franchising, obviously, purchasing the rights to sell products and services under a certain name in exchange, you're committing franchising fees and royalty payments uh, in exchange for that. Uh, franchising is great because it's a proven business opportunity. We know it works. Okay, if you decide to purchase or buy into a McDonald's franchise and you go through all the, the rigorous hoops and different things and so McDonald's, they approve you, um, obviously McDonald's has done fairly well. Okay? Uh, and so that's a proven business opportunity. You have instant brand recognition. People know who you are, what you do, what your products taste like and all those other things. You don't have to commit all of the resources into educating consumers what it is that you do. Uh, so a proven business opportunity, certainly beneficial. 
You also have access to management expertise. Uh, with McDonald's, we talked about the education program, the training program that they put all of their franchisees through, right? Hamburger University, I believe it's still referred to. Uh, and so having access to the expertise of those individuals is only going to help you. Um, you have a lot of resources, people to tell you how to do certain things. There's a vast network of franchisees uh, that you can coordinate with for best practices and find out how to do certain things. Uh, and so that is beneficial and that's only going to help you operate your business. Obvious disadvantage would be the startup costs and royalty payments. Okay, we've talked about those at great length. You typically have that franchise fee that you have to commit and then any additional costs associated with acquiring land, the, the, the actual building, and anything else. Uh, but then you have those ongoing royalty payments, you know, and those are eating away at your profits because you have a percentage of sales that's going to the parent company, whomever that may be, Burger King, McDonald's, Subway, whomever. Uh, but you also have management restrictions, you know, and with a business that you are acquiring or you're starting from scratch, you have very high flexibility. You know, you can take it any direction you to choose. You can market your business the way that you want to. You can start selling products and services like you want to. With a franchise, you have a lot of restrictions. Okay, you have to go by what they say. Okay, you can't introduce a new product because you think it's going to work. That has to go through management, and there's an approval process there because they don't want any of their franchisees doing anything that's going to hurt their brand. They want to maintain a consistent image there, and so there's an approval process that's, that's available there. So let's say that we've decided what, what business we're going to start. Either we're going to buy one, we're going to start one from scratch, or we're going to franchise. Let's talk a little about financing options. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here, but at least go over some of the more common things that may be available to you, some more common than others. Okay. First of which is your personal resources. Any uh, savings accounts, 401ks, anything that you have access to personally, obviously, you know, you may not want to use 401ks, but if it's something that you're really passionate about and feel like you're going to be successful, that might not be too, too much of a bad thing. Some of us might think, I'm not giving up my 401k, that's my financial, you know, security in the future. Some may have more of a, an easier time with that, and that's goes back to doing that self-assessment and knowing what you're comfortable with. Uh, but personal resources are obviously a big, uh, a big source of uh, financing for entrepreneurs, particularly at the startup phase. Chances are you're going to be using some personal resources uh, to commit to something uh, if you're going to start a small business. Next thing is you can take out loans. Okay, uh, You can take out loans from family and friends. Okay. Certainly your ability to. I was never comfortable with this uh, and never wanted to hand out loans to family or friends uh, because you know when you're, when you're sitting at, at Christmas dinner across the table from a person that owes you money, uh, it just kind of changes the relationship, right? You start to evaluate their little decisions that they make. Uh, like for example, if you know, a family member of yours owes you maybe say $10,000 to start a business and you find out they're taking a vacation, they're going to Vegas for a week or so. And you start to evaluate how, why they're doing certain things and critiquing them and then you start building resentment and getting angry. Um, and so those starts of things can't, those types of things can start to surface there, um, which is I've always maintained the position that I won't loan money to family and friends. Uh, if I am going to give them anything, I will gift it, meaning that it's gone, it's gone. I have no intention of ever recovering it, uh, nor a financial need to. Uh, so if that's the case, then certainly I would accept gifts. I would provide gifts, no strings attached. That's great, uh, but I don't want to get into a, a situation in which a family member uh, essentially is my, is my creditor. Uh, next thing is you can take out loans from financial institutions. Okay, This is probably not going to be something that will be available to you in the startup phase. Um, so usually you're going to have to go by your own financial resources, right? Your, your personal savings account and different things, money from family and friends first before you can get to financial institutions. This is usually something that's months, uh, if not maybe a year or two out because you have to prove that you have something that's going to work, right? Not a flash in the pan idea, but something that's sustainable because remember, banks are in the job of assessing risk and they're going to look at you and think, 
how likely is this person going to pay me back? And they're going to look at your idea. They're going to look at the financial statements that you provided, your market analysis, and all those other things, your entire business plan. And they make a decision on you. And how likely are you, with this idea, going to be able to repay them? And I can tell you that financial institutions do not primarily finance small businesses. Okay? Um, usually you have to operate for a little while, prove that you can actually operate before you get into uh, taking out loans for banks and those types of things. All right, next you have venture capitalists, uh, Heritage, a uh, popular venture capitalist. And venture capitalists uh, essentially are venture capitalist uh, enterprises or firms, if you will. Uh, what this involves is you have a, an actual company, which is the venture capital firm, and they have a number of investors. And so they basically, you can approach them, pitch an idea, they will in turn run it by investors and seek money to invest in your company. Okay? Uh, so these are people that are typically wanting to invest in exchange for ownership. Right? They want a percentage, they want a piece of the pie, they want a piece of your business because they know if they have 50 or 51% ownership that they can overrule you and they can decide what happens. Okay? Um, you might as well forget about this in the early stages. Uh, venture capital money is very, very uncommon in the early, early stages. Uh, typically, this is for companies that have been around for a while, have operated, have something that could potentially boom into a, a very, very successful business and obviously people want to get on board because it's going to have a great return on investment. And next you have angels, angel investors, okay, actual wealthy individuals who are looking for a good return on their investment, okay. They're not necessarily happy with what's getting paid by their savings account, probably a quarter to a half a percent if they're lucky. They really want to invest in startups that potentially can make it big. Corporations or, or businesses, mind you, that can potentially return 30, 40 percent uh, on their investment. Okay, and so these individuals can be a source of income or a source of financing, although once again, not necessarily that common early on. All right, there are a number of different financing resources that we haven't gone into. Uh, some SBA-backed loans, which are backed by the Small Business Administration and those types of things. Um, those, I believe, are referred to in the textbook. So feel free and read up on those and just get kind of an idea of what they are, although you can probably deduce that simply from the name. All right, uh, last thing we'll get into here, opportunities and threats for small business, okay? Nothing's more threatening than a honey badger, as you can see. Uh, there are a lot of threats that are uh, confront small business. Okay, I mean, obviously we've went over; they have a higher risk of failure. Okay, that goes without saying, of course. Uh, and so we know from the statistics that that certainly is true. Uh, that should not be a deterrent from you, you know, writing a business plan, doing the market analysis, and finding out if you have something that's worth pursuing. Um, you might even do the research and find out, you know what, this isn't a good idea, and that's okay because you saved yourself a lot of headaches later on. Uh, you have a lack of knowledge and experience. Typically, people that start small businesses usually start because they suffer what is referred to as an entrepreneurial seizure, Okay, and that's a, a term that's used in Emith which was written by Michael Gerber, a great book if you're interested in kind of brushing up on some entrepreneurship terminology and things. It talks a lot about franchising, but uh, what the entrepreneurial seizure is, is the person that has a technical type job, plumber, construction worker, whatever, uh, and is just sick and tired of following the orders of somebody else, thinks, you know what, I can do the job better than they can, so I'm going to start my own plumbing business. But they haven't considered all of the business side of things, right? The accounting, the bookkeeping, the finances, the marketing, uh, how to run an actual successful business. There are a lot of things that are entailed simply beyond the technical side of it. And so that lack of knowledge and experience is a significant threat to small businesses and a primary driver uh, on why they fail. Uh, probably the most significant driver of why businesses fail is they have too little money. Right? Your cash dries up. You can no longer continue to operate the business. Okay. Uh, next, 
bigger regulatory burdens. Okay, you have to consider things like workers' compensation and Social Security, disability insurance, all those other things that you did not have to consider before you started having employees and running an actual business. Okay, uh, certain environmental regulations potentially. So there is bigger regulatory burdens for small businesses potentially because you don't have a significant amount of sales to absorb those just yet like larger corporations do. Uh, another threat is you have higher insurance costs. Okay, If you have a handful of employees, chances are you're going to pay more money for insurance because you're buying things on a smaller scale. Right? That's how large companies get discounts because I'm buying policies for 20,000 employees, so I'm going to get some group discounts, of course, just from purchasing on a mass scale. Well, as a small business owner, you would not be so lucky to obtain those same benefits. Opportunities. Okay, it's not all bad. Never is. Uh, you can explore some market niches. Okay, you can explore something that isn't a, a large company isn't interested in. Right, large companies are going to stick to things that are big. Right, how can I make the most money? Where are the most people in? Those are larger markets. They're not going to go for the smaller markets. Right, the specialty type markets. Uh, I know a. Uh, uh, a story of a, a young woman, probably in her mid twenties, out in New York, who um, was very fluent in Spanish and French, and um, wanted to do uh, start a babysitting service. Okay, uh, but she did so uh, not necessarily from a standpoint I'm just going to watch your kids and watch your TV and eat your food, but she she coupled that with a passion she had for music and also for foreign languages, and what she does is it's almost an educational type environment where she will watch your kids, right? Make sure that they're safe when you're at work or at the grocery store or on date night or whatever. Um, but also she plays guitar and sings and in the process helps children learn different languages, whether it's French, I believe she might do Mandarin uh, and, and as well as Spanish. And so that's an example of a, a, a niche market, right? Because you're not going to see uh, Walmarts and large corporations think, hey, you know what? We got to go after this uh music, education, foreign language market, right? It's so specific that they really don't care. But it's an opportunity that you could explore uh, because you have the resources to and it's specific enough where it's taking advantage of your passions and your talent and those types of things. Another opportunity for small businesses is to explore personal customer service, right? We've all had experiences from large corporations where they really just don't care because the person that's helping you uh, does not see any type of profit from the sale, doesn't see any benefit from doing so. But small businesses, their livelihood relies upon how they interact with customers. And so typically you're going to get a lot more personal service from small businesses because they want to make you repeat customers. They have more skin in the game because their livelihood depends upon that. And if you're a small business owner, you can certainly add some personal touches to your business, whatever that entails, and provide additional services and things for free just to communicate that you value your customers. Uh, next, small business owners typically have lower overhead costs, and what that means is you're typically not paying a lot of leases, rent, and all those other things uh, to have large retail establishments, let's say like a Best Buy, for example, that obviously has to pay for the leasing space for their very, very large stores, uh, has to heat and cool those, has to pay insurance and all those other things. Those are things that you can bypass, right? We know that we can start a, a simple internet business for next to nothing. Okay, You can do e-commerce and that's very, very common as a way of starting out. And so you can take advantage of those lower overhead costs as a way to increase your profit margins and increase your chances of being successful. Um, I always recommend trying things out on a smaller scale. Right? Don't start and open up a, a, a store or a restaurant with, without having a proven business opportunity uh, unless you can commit just some smaller resources because I've always said that you want to fail early if you're going to fail. Okay, you don't want to try a small business for five years and realize it's not a good idea. You'd want to fail within the first couple months so you can move on to something bigger and better. Next opportunity that small businesses have is to leverage technology. You can do a lot of things uh, from your home with technology, with a, a personal computer, some software, uh, and, and just some, some pure grit and know-how and determination. 
Um, so technology has made it so that you can now uh, start a, a worldwide internet business overnight if you want to and they've made it so that it's much easier to so take advantage of the resources it's uh, although you you see a lot of businesses out there it has never been easier to start one uh, just because of technology and how easy that has made it and how many barriers that has reduced or how many uh, barriers have been removed for people to actually start their own companies all right, we've talked about the business plan before. I'm not going to go to it in, in too much detail. You have some information in your textbook that really discusses it rather heavily. Uh, but just to go over kind of the basics, uh, business plan, you have the executive summary, which is just that first page or two that gives an overview of your plan. Typically, you want to include that because sometimes investors will only look at your executive summary to summarize what's in the plan. Uh, you have a description of your business, you know, what it is that you do. Uh, what are you selling? You know your market. Who are you selling to? Um, the size of that market potentially. You're going to research competitors, research the industries. You're going to talk about how you're going to operate as a business, where you're going to get your finances from, uh, who you need to hire in terms of personnel, the skill sets, the type of people that you want to surround yourself with, and then obviously your pro forma financial statements, your projections. What do you expect to produce? Uh, in a year or two from now. Sometimes difficult to do. If you have past sales, that makes it easier because you have something to go off of. But if you haven't sold anything, you kind of have to make these up. And you want to be realistic. You don't want to say we're going to do $1 million in sales the first year because that's generally very uncommon. And be honest. You know, Take a look at the market. Think about what you can reasonably capture in terms of a percentage and put a dollar amount on that. If you were to sell, sell you know, a thousand widgets based upon this percentage of the market. If I was able to obtain that, this is how much I should have in sales. These are my costs, those types of things. Uh, on a side note, uh, if you're looking for more information on business plans, if you're interested and you're enrolled in, at Willow International or, or really anything, uh, any type of college uh, for the most part, um, at least at uh, Willow International, we do offer a course, uh, BA52, which is Intro to Entrepreneurship. Uh, that is a course that revolves around the business plan, so we spend an entire semester working on uh, creating a business plan and students really have a lot of fun because they're working on ideas that are going to make them money and things that they're interested in. So that might be something that you potentially are interested in. A um, little bit of a plug there. Uh, but hopefully that's something that you might be interested in if you want to start your own business and are looking to kind of test run it in a, in a safe environment where you can ask questions and get feedback, of course. All right, so entrepreneurship around the world. Uh, we talked about some areas are more conducive to entrepreneurship than others. Uh, really, what are the factors, and there are many, many factors, of course, we're going to go over some common ones, that encourage individuals of an economy or of a country to engage in entrepreneurship. First thing is your per capita income. Uh, what you f will find is that if the per capita income in a country is low, meaning that the amount of money that is made per person, not just working individual, but per person, so children are generally counted in this statistic, if it's very low, the tendency for entrepreneurship or the prevalence of entrepreneurship usually is higher because we've discussed entrepreneurship out of necessity. People need to find a way to get more income to raise their standard of living. Okay, So in countries that have a low... Uh, per capita income, you'll find that the urgency of entrepreneurship is higher. Whereas in the U.S., you know, a lot of people enjoy pretty safe and, and comfortable standards of living just by working an eight to five job or working for someone else. And so the urgency might not be there because obviously, if I'm leaving a job that pays me sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year to pursue this entrepreneurial venture, I don't think I'm going to go for it. I'm pretty comfortable now. Maybe I don't like my job. Maybe I don't like getting out of bed in the morning, but I don't know. I'm not willing to risk it all. Uh, next thing, opportunity costs. Okay, uh, Depending upon the country, you'll find that different areas have greater con or opportunity costs than others. Uh, we talked about the United States here. Okay, if you wanted, uh, first off, let me backtrack a little bit. Opportunity costs are what you would give up to pursue something. And so you have to consider that. It's an accounting term, I know, you probably don't like it, uh, but it is a very important thing to consider even outside of accounting, right? If I decide I'm going to pursue 
this small business idea, what am I giving up? Am I giving up a full-time job? What could I be doing instead of that? And so in the U.S., the opportunity cost is typically greater, right? Because, oh, well, I'm giving up a position to where I'm making sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. Let's say that's the case. That's pretty high of an opportunity cost. I don't think it's worth it. But if you are in a low-income country where you're making $10,000 a year, wow, that's not a really high opportunity cost. I probably would would go ahead and start or go through with my small business idea because it's not like I'm missing out a whole on a whole lot. So that's the idea of an opportunity cost. It's what you have to give up to obtain something else. I'll give you another example that might resonate more soundly with you uh, is in terms of studying. You know, I, I, I tell this to my students consistently in class uh, and it's, you know, the courses that I typically teach um, require some hard work and determination to, to continually study. But that presents an opportunity cost, meaning that if you study for my exams, then you cannot, uh, well, look at social media, you can't go to the movie with friends, or go to the, uh, a movie with friends, you cannot work. Those are your opportunity costs. Those are things that you're giving up. And if in your mind, the opportunity cost is too high, meaning that you don't feel that there's going to be a significant value in studying, then you're not going to give up those things to pursue studying. Okay? Hopefully you do, uh, but that's just one example. All right, next, the culture and political environment. Okay? Uh, certain countries are also more supportive of small business and entrepreneurship than others. Uh, typically, although some would argue to the contrary, uh, relatively speaking, the United States is generally very supportive, although we have s suffered from some uh, greater regulation as of late. Uh, but in comparison to other countries, we're still generally pretty good. Uh, and so we encourage entrepreneurship. We try to make sure that financing is available for people that want to start small businesses. We try to make sure that there are educational resources available to people who want to start small businesses. Things like the SBA, the Small Business Administration, uh, and other countless uh, organizations that are supposed to encourage small businesses. Uh, and so if the country is not encouraging small businesses, not making avenues for them to pursue different entrepreneurial ventures, then obviously entrepreneurship is going to suffer as a result. All right, that concludes uh, our lecture here on small business and entrepreneurship. If you do have any questions, please do let me, don't, don't, don't hesitate to email me either if you're interested in maybe some resources, finding a little bit more about certain things. Maybe you're interested in, in courses where we cover the business plan in greater detail. Be happy to help you in any way that I can. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.